You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 124, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, today we've got Dr. Ann Lichtenwallner uh, here to talk about bird flu and general biosecurity issues um, where poultry is concerned, um, with the backyard gardener in mind who's, who's keeping birds and that sort of thing. Who is Ann Lichtenwallner? She's an associate professor at the University of Maine at Orno. She has a doctor of veterinary veterinary medicine (laughs) and a PhD. Uh, She's a director and diagnostician for the University of Maine Animal Health Lab. Uh, She's involved in research in the fields of infectious diseases and parasitology. She studies both domestic and wildlife species and she has lots of published papers in peer reviewed journals. So you can take what she's saying to the bank uh, she, we had her on the show last year for two, I think we did two episodes. It was so we mm-hmm. talked so much, we had to break it up into two episodes, uh, talking about raising chickens in general, just sort of for the beginner in mind, everything you'd want to know about uh, keeping chickens. And we have her back today to talk more about HPAI bird flu and general security, biosecurity issues associated with keeping poultry. Um, so Anne, <laughs> please uh, say hello and uh, briefly outline what you do. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit more about what we do down here. And the, the, um, the lab has been uh, supported by Cooperative Extension for many years. And, uh, and traditionally, of course, before my time here, which started in 2008, uh, Maine was such a big poultry state. Uh, and then um, over the years, uh, for economic reasons, animal health reasons, blah, blah, then a lot of the really large poultry producers moved out of Maine and moved to the south uh, of here. Um, but one of the really cool things is that there were, there were still many people in Maine who had had chickens, understood the business of having chickens, and didn't mind if they were having you know, their kids and friends and things like that and helping them out with chicken questions and things like that. So there's sort of a tradition of raising poultry, and we have a lot of backyard poultry here in Maine. Um, we have... Oh. In fact, uh, some uh, growing concerns, uh, or rather growing businesses that also have poultry that are on more of a commercial um, level. They're making some money with their poultry, selling started birds and selling eggs and selling um, heritage breeds and things like that. So um, while these might not be the big, the same scale, as the really big brown egg farms, you know, in years past, um, there's still a lot going on. And, uh, and then there are people like me that have tiny flocks, but enjoy them a great deal. And so those are the people I usually end up uh, counseling a lot of times. Um, our, our lab, um, is, you know, functions to provide service to the industry and, 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 to, and farmers in general, clients, I guess. And um, we operate on kind of a, um, you know, cost basis. Uh, so our, our, our services are not terribly expensive. And uh, what we really like is when our clients um, actually have a clinical vet uh, that they can ask for help on the farm uh, and who can actually do prescriptions for them and things like that, where where, what we can do is we can provide diagnostic information to help that vet do their job. And then we can also um, basically provide management information to the client to avoid problems. Um, So typically, we someone brings a a dead bird into our lab and I take it apart and try and figure out what happened and then I end up sending a report about that but also sending some general information about the condition that we found um so your vet and you can you know help solve the problem and prevent more of it happening so anyway yeah that's that's kind of what I do um I did not always do chickens although I've always been interested in birds and uh and I have a border collie who's needs to tell the neighborhood that <laughs> something's going on protecting so you can, from something <laughs> yeah something in the background there but anyway that's what that's what we do so we do a lot of service to a lot of other people uh, other producers as well i work with small ruminants and you know we do some i've done plenty of moose <laughs> yeah. uh, cases wow. in the past so you know it's maine it's a very diverse uh state lots of different kinds of animal health uh questions to help out so and today we're going to talk about uh uh, HPAI bird flu um, to start off with. So maybe you can just 
explain to us what that acronym uh, represents and sure. uh, why we should be thinking about it. Yeah, well, it, you know, we HPAI highly pathogenic avian influenza is uh. um, is a group of viruses that have um, certain types of proteins by which they're characterized. They have an H uh, group and an N group. And, um, and so, and I am not an expert in this area, it, but this is something that really concerns all of us that have anything to do with um, poultry these days. Um, so um, it sometimes has been um, a, a what we call a zoonotic um, disease. So that means a disease that can affect both people and animals. Uh, and especially those that go from animals to people. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so it's it, it, the avian influenza and also swine influenza. They, those two groups of animals tend to have influenza viruses that are pretty um, easily mutated and can become zoonotic. Um, so um, we really, you know, there are historical epidemics of HPAI in people. Um, and so we are very cautious about it. Um, the HPAI, the modern version that we that we have around the world right now, um, has been uh, was a problem in the United States in 2015, and it's worldwide. It's been a problem off and on um, for probably as long as we've known about it. Um, but the last year or so, uh, <laughs> Europe, Europe and Asia have had a lot of problems with it. And we think that probably the strain that we have now in the United States probably came right over to us with migrating wild birds. Um, you know, they wonderful creatures that have these incredible migrations across the planet. And unfortunately, if they pick up a disease in one place, they're going to bring it to another place. Um, and because it's so transmissible, um, it can be transmitted by respiratory secretions and close contact, but also by the manure from the birds. And it's actually fairly stable. It can last for you know weeks to months in the manure under certain conditions, um, but it can be killed by sunlight, um, sunlight time, drying, you know, and of course a lot of antiviral agents like disinfectants can kill it. So. Um, so one of the big things um, that we've been saying. Um, to our um, our poultry owners for a long, long time is keep your birds separate from wild birds. And um, I always include like little perching birds along with the geese and ducks that are the most likely to transmit that HPAI. But, uh, but really, um, you know, wild birds in general can cause diseases of several different kinds, including those tried, true, and simple diseases such as salmonella and uh, mycoplasma, some of those, um, which aren't good to have in any you know, way, shape, or form, but we don't consider them foreign animal diseases and you know, we don't turn inside out um, when they show up. Uh, so though, um, in general, um, some of the things I've been telling people in the last you know, six months or so um, have been the same things that I tend to say normally. I'm just saying them a little more intensely right now. Um, right. And, uh, and also our state vets um, and our federal vets here in the United States have responded very, very well to um, the danger of HPAI by putting out um, actually the USDA APHIS and your Canadian agencies also have some really good information online about what's going on and where it's happening in your country and our country, including maps, I think, and, and ways that you can check in your province to see if it's in your province right. um, and what you should do about it. Um, so, so, so kudos to all of them. I think the responses have been quite good. The, the, right. the, Oh, upshot is that the cat's out of the bag. Um, we have, um, I think it was in February, perhaps, that we had the first cases, I think in New Brunswick, of HPAI in North America. And then soon thereafter, there followed some cases on the East Coast of the United States, including here in Maine. Um, right. And so every time there is one of those cases, there's a ripple effect because... Um, 
the, the, the veterinarians in charge of the region, so you're, for us, our state veterinarians, and for you, your provincial uh, veterinarians, and then our federal or your federal reps as well, have to organize a response, which means that they have to get rid of the birds from the farm where it was found. Um, and that's not pleasant for anybody. And uh, also then they have to, and this is the ripple part, they also have to survey an area, a certain distance, it depends on where you are and a, a lot of factors, but it, it's generally uh, kilometers to miles of, around that farm. So you can imagine, you know, if you have six birds in your backyard and you live, you know, in a township or a, you know, or a, a very well habited area, um, you're going to affect a lot of people around you. Um, right. So, so is the is the mechanism yeah. like I've got birds in my backyard and they stay in my backyard, but uh, because I've got them just, you know, uh, let, let's say I let them loose in my garden to, to take out some of my snails and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, while they're out there. Uh, they oh. scuff up the ground and breathe in some other bird poop or they drink out of a puddle or so yeah. basically so they they, they or, or some other bird gets the flu from them and they go to my neighbor's backyard and give the flu to my neighbor's birds is that is the vector uh, the the wild birds is that mainly the vector we, well we think so um right. now the vector can be water like if you have a whole bunch of geese that come into a pond or like so there's this pond that has a, an outflow stream right uh, and that pond is on your property and those geese hang out in there and have a blast and defecate a lot in the <laughs> water and then that water flows to your neighbor's place. Let me go back to say um, what our, our state veterinarians decided to do so that we didn't overreact. Um, okay. we, they decided that if someone calls with a dead bird report and they have lost several birds um, and there isn't another good reason for them to have died, especially if they're chickens, because chickens are quite sensitive to this, or turkeys, um, and they know that they have some possible exposure to wild birds, ducks or geese, um, so wild waterfowl. So that could be, you know, that they sometimes have geese and ducks. So the, the, the first case that we had here in Maine, uh, they were people who had seen geese and ducks on their land and they did also have chickens and suddenly they were losing some birds. Mm. So both those things. So uh, you know, loss of poultry, chickens or turkeys, um, more than one, and, uh, and then exposure to wild birds. And that is, those are kind of our trigger points. And then right. what they is called us and said, hey, can you do some necropsies for us? We kind of wonder if there's HPAI. Right. And we were able to um, diagnose it uh, really by means of the autopsy or the necropsy. But of course, you don't just do it that way. You send out uh, PCR swabs. Uh, so really, there's, oh yeah, there's <laughs> laboratory uh, confirmation of that. It's not as right. not as straightforward as just opening up the bird. So I see. Yeah. Wow. So it's almost the way we've been doing uh, management of COVID in a lot of ways. In I a mean, lot of ways. You don't Absolutely. send you send dead bodies uh, for necropsies, but uh, well, not that we've yeah, been doing well, this. May, well, at least you hope you don't. I guess anyway, they do but, do it after the fact, I suppose. I but suppose. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, but, 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 uh, but the point, I think I want to jump on that point because it's a good point. And that is that the whole pandemic thing, I think, taught many of us about managing risk, assessing risk, how big a deal is it to you and your family for you mm -hmm. to get COVID or not to get COVID. And of course it was different when we didn't have vaccines. That's right. And that huge wave of mortalities that occurred was so sad worldwide. Yes. yes. And a fair amount of that had to do with the <clears throat> fact that we didn't have, of course we didn't have the vaccines. And also we didn't yet and fully embrace how to reduce the risk, especially for those who were more vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, so similarly here, it's really important for everybody to think about, okay, like I've got four aged hens, right? And I, but I live near a river. 
Now, my birds are not going to do any free ranging <laughs> um, this year at all. I uh, used to sometimes have them out in tractor on my lawn and things like that because they, mm -hmm. they have fun. But they're not doing any of that because it isn't that I'm so afraid to lose my forehands. I don't want to. I like them a lot. But but what I don't want to do is invite HPAI into my neighborhood mm. because I have neighbors around me that have their, you know, their very beloved groups of birds too. And we might, you know, I might oh. trigger a bit of a, you know, awful situation in our, in our area. Yeah, so yeah. I'm also talking a lot about it because what I don't want to do either is completely hide from the reality of it. And I don't want to teach people to hide from the reality of it because frankly, it's, it's quite a dangerous disease. It is, uh, it has affected uh, over 40 million birds in the United States alone. So I don't even know right. what the numbers are in Canada right now. Yes. But with, you know, yeah. So it's, it's a big deal. And then it, and then also it affects our trade in poultry and poultry products. Mm. So, so as of, I think today, in fact, I think it was this evening, <laughs> Um, New Brunswick just got the go ahead to be able to sell, if they want to, uh, poultry and poultry products to uh, the United States because their restrictions just got lifted from that very early spring diagnosis of HPAI mm. province. And, right. and, and there are, and it's all over Canada. I mean, there's, uh, you know, so I, I sent you that link. I hope that you can share it. Um, with yeah, your well, because will do. Yeah, sure. the Canadian agencies have been really good about being transparent. Um, right. Uh, one of the things I, I had hoped over the course of, of the COVID thing, you know, I, I work uh, my regular day job when I'm not maritime gardening guy, I work for government here in, in, in Nova Scotia, uh, provincial government. I prepare internal documents where I say, we've got a problem. This is a number of different options for a solution. Here's the solution we're recommending. And then one thing we do is say, here's all the risks. Basically, these here's the bad things that might happen if we do this. Um, and then we have to attach uh, a likelihood. You know, like, this is yeah. really likely. You know, here's a bad thing that might happen. It's very likely, like, like you know, the population will be very upset. <laughs> Just, right. You know, or the, you know, that's a bad thing that either might, you know, or, you know, that sort of thing, right? Or people in this particular category will be very dissatisfied, right? Or it's going to increase the cost for a certain uh, you know, service, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things I had hoped was that the public would develop risk literacy, I guess the way of putting it, right? I, I remember at the height of COVID, at the very beginning when people were like dying and we didn't know what this thing was and we had no vaccine or anything like that, uh, my wife is going to the grocery store and I mean, she's really nervous and worried, right? And I remember saying to her, come on now, you know, like you're much more risk of dying on the drive there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Than dying yeah. of than yeah. getting COVID and dying of that. Like the probability, if, if we were to assign a value to that probability, the probability is greater that you'll get in a horrendous car accident and die instantly on the way to the grocery store. That was my way of her calming her down. It didn't really work. It didn't work. I just gave her a new thing to worry about, right? Uh, but, you know, yeah. I, you know, I was trying to say, like, every day I drive to work in rush hour traffic, it's the most dangerous thing I do, it, you know, like, uh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you've got a really good point there. I think that, that again, that skill in managing risk, understanding and managing understanding it intelligently, and also knowing when it's the risk for others might be different than for you and making an informed choice about what your behavior should be when it actually involves a bigger circle around you. You know, my, I have so many friends that are elderly and, um, and I, and I'm just, I've been kind of like, you yeah. know, hovering away from them still a little bit because there are so many COVID cases still out there, but, I know. Anyway. but they're vaccinated, right? You know, so it's, right. it's all better. But the reason but, uh, I brought it up is because it seems yeah. like the way you're, you know, managing mm -hmm. uh, spread is you're, you know, you're not doing like mass lockdown, mass mass protect sort of thing. It's more like we're going to, you know, we're we're going to investigate cases that seem to be the most likely to be problematic or the more where the most risk. We're going to go where the most risk is, um, you know, and and work work out from there. Yeah. 
And at the same time, um, because I am not a state vet nor a regulatory vet, what I did was work through the extension model of now what I'm, I really want to do is get people the tools they need to help assess that risk. Right. Um, so I want to keep their awareness high about this without being fear mongering. Yes. But just, you know, like I, 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 you know, my birds are doing great and, uh, you know, but they don't go to bird shows. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. and, oh, no. and a lot of people have birds that do and love doing it, but it's just like, you know, I, some of the fairs, um, I've been talking with some of the fair folks and about what they're going to do this year. And they came to me and said, you know, we actually are going to have a virtual poultry show this year we're not going to have we're not asking people to bring their birds not because of covid but because of hpai and i and i said you know what a great idea <laughs> yeah. you know i don't i don't want to discourage um you know 4-h kids showing their animals and things like that but it's just not a good time historically for for doing this so so yeah i i you know i i'm you know, sort of several ways of of you know kind of trying to prevent this problem or, or stop it in its tracks. And um, we, you know, one of the things that's really different about this particular um, year is that we have a lot of backyard flocks with HPAI here in the United States. I'm not sure about Canada, but certainly here. We actually have more backyard flocks than commercial flocks that have been affected. It's almost 50-50, but it's still slightly more. And in the in 2015, when this happened, um, there was a lot of loss to the um, commercial birds. Um, and you didn't see it being diagnosed very much on backyard flocks. But I think a certain amount of that was that the backyard people didn't either didn't know about it or just didn't even want to think about it. And And I think now what's kind of encouraging is I think one of the reasons we're finding it in the backyard flocks is not that it wasn't there in the first place or that backyard uh, birds are more healthy. I think it's that um, people are willing to kind of just say, you know, <laughs> had several birds die mysteriously. They know to ask and they're not, um, I hope it's not just ignorance <laughs> that they don't know what the reaper they're doing is it's very pro-social behavior. They're protecting other people like them uh, right. by, you know, just dealing with it. And, right. um, and so I, I, you know, my hat's off to the people that are willing to do that because it's not easy. Um, what is the, uh, what's the survival rate or the probability, you know, like there's probably a mortality rate or like when, when birds get uh, a bird flu, like HPAI, is it like, is it like us where it's like point less than less than 1% or less than 0.1%. I think it's point, I can't remember what flu is. I think it's 0.1% um, mortality, but for birds, is it, I assume it's higher it, it's because a there's funny... less, less variab. I think there's less, I'm guessing there's less genetic for variability among poultry than there is among people. Um, there's, there's still a fair amount of genetic variability, but, but it's the variability of the virus too, because the virus uh, does mutate a lot. And, and the other thing is their exposure to the virus. For the most part with HPAI, um, it's pretty much fatal. Um, wow. if, yeah. So if you might not lose your whole flock, because they might not all have been exposed to the same amount of the virus at the same time, right. but they, you're, <laughs> Right now, you're going to lose your whole flock because they're going to put the rest of them down, uh, and 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 that is just because the mortality in this in this disease is so high, um, and it's uh, it and and not to not to mince around, it's it does have a big commercial impact. Uh, yeah. so that's part of what's driving all this. It's not the only thing at all, but it's definitely part of what's driving it. But then the third thing, and this is not minor is the potential for it to become zoonotic. That's what so, I was just about, that's where I was gonna go with this. So I mean, so how yeah. do you how you deal with the risk of its uh, jumping to human beings? Sure. Like all the yeah. worst viruses ever in the history of ever, including monkeypox. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we know too much, right? You yes. Know? <laughs> but um, well, um, so the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, which is kind of like our, um, our, it's an agency that basically takes 
all the medical um, information into um, a consideration and also can mandate what we do. Um, they have, uh, they follow all the people who have been exposed. So if, so as soon as we had, uh, as soon as my team diagnosed the first case here in Maine, um, they were on the phone to me and my, and my technician saying, okay, um, you need to check in with us every so many uh, hours. <laughs> so I think it was, and then, you know, decreasing frequency over time, but they kind of watched us like hawks for about two weeks. Wow. And, um, and that's true for the farms where the birds have been found and diagnosed. And it's true for the teams that have to respond with the state vet to go out to those farms and euthanize birds and then also um, arrange for composting or incineration of those birds. So it's wow. like every step of that way, you've got a team of CDC people following you around kind of. But it's, it's I was really impressed with how well they did that and uh and, i mean it wasn't that disruptive but it's just that you you you're very mindful um, i was hoping i wouldn't get COVID or something in the middle of that because that would really confuse things but um, <laughs> i didn't and then, you know everything was fine we we're fine so in this outbreak in the united states i think they're the last i heard which is about a, a week or so ago i got an update that there was still only like one case of a person that they they think may have gotten flu from being heavily exposed to poultry on a farm that had right. APAI. Oh, wow. So we're lucky, you know, we're lucky because that's not necessarily the case in Asia, for instance, with different strains of this flu. Right, yeah. Yeah. So I should ask, I mean, I guess we should get into it. How does one, why don't we just walk through everything people should do to to lower risk, uh, yeah, just to keep their, uh, what's what term you use? Biosecurity issues associated with keeping poultry. So okay. talk to us about keeping your, your birds safe, uh, you know, I guess preventing anything from happening at all. And then also what to do if you think something is happening. Okay. Well, um, let me start with that first, last one first, just okay. to say, Reverse let's order. get that out of the way. All right. um, so in your area and in, with under your federal agencies, um, you have different rules than we do. Um, right. but Half my viewers are in the U.S., so you can. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, um, so in so I hope that you can share those two sites that I sent you, one for Canada and the other one for the U.S. Yeah. that have to do with. Um, what's going on in your area and checking that out, which is another part of this response, but, um, but also um, what you should do in terms of informing your regional authorities. So in the main, uh, uh, when we had the main outbreak happening, we had a, we had like an 800, but it was 866 number that you, we were asked, uh, we were asking everybody if they have a, a, a dead bird, you know, mystery. You know, I didn't hit it with a car or whatever, you know, it wasn't supposed to die. I don't know why it's dead. Then you were supposed to call that 866 number and they would kind of triage you and find out whether you were likely to have an HPAI bird or not. And uh, if you weren't, then they sent you to us so we could help figure out what the heck was going on if it wasn't HPAI. And if you were, then they came out and they did the swabbing and all of that stuff. And they informed you, you know, what your choices were. Um, so in Canada, um, I, I assume that you have a, an analogous situation. Um, but um, but any time when you have a bird that dies, and you know, even if we're not in an HPAI era, you know, you can call our lab, or you can call your uh, regional veterinarian, your state or provincial veterinarian, and right. uh, and they should be able to guide you. If they are right. wild birds that you find, um, then usually contacting your wildlife agency. So whether it be your provincial or your federal agency is a really good choice. Um, and they may just tell you, oh, you know, if you find one or two, we're not too concerned. Here, what they would say is, if you find five or more, we're concerned. Um, but they still uh, live here, yeah. Yeah, I have like, uh, we have pheasants on the property all the time. Like they literally mm -hmm. wake, they wake up stuff in the morning like roosters. Um, so if I were to find uh, a mother, mother pheasant hen and five dead baby hens on my lawn <laughs> yeah I, i'd want to pick up the phone <laughs> yes yes that is the kind of thing exactly the kind of yeah. thing where you want to pick up the phone and yeah. uh 
you know, the worst case scenario is they'll, they'll tell you, you know, we're not interested. We don't think it's a risk. It's not in your area. That's not, you know, how it presents, blah, blah. And you'll feel better about it. But they'll also tell you whether you should compost the birds or incinerate them or, you know, et cetera. So um, right. another aside, I guess, on that topic of finding dead birds is no, they're not okay to eat. <laughs> <laughs> that's where Believe my mind is going <laughs> no i know but people do ask me these things and i i just say look if you didn't see it looking terrifically healthy and then you killed it yeah, then yeah. it's not okay to eat yes. um, so with anything yes. if you're you know if you eat mammals and birds so i yeah. do but anyway okay so um then you had asked me okay what do people what should people do how do they find guidance on this so um i'm going to give you my quick synopsis but I'm going to, again, begin by directing you to the federal agency in Canada. Um, and again, that link may be helpful for you to find that information and the USDA APHIS site, which has this lovely thing called biosecurity for the birds um, that they've had online for years. And it was really designed to keep things like salmonella and other problems off the farm, but it sure works great for AI. Uh, so it's it's really good detailed information that you can that you can seek out. You said AI, um, you mean avian influence? I do, yes, okay, not yeah. artificial intelligence. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> um, okay, so but do look, but do know what the risk is for your area. So when you're trying to decide what to do, you know, should you keep your birds in all the time? You know, what's safe? then check out the risk in your area. That might really make the decision for you very quickly. Um, so then the biosecurity guidelines in general that I like to follow are probably, you know, when you think about during the pandemic lockdown for your family, what did we tell you? Stay inside and don't mix with others. Um, so, um, so, you know, that's kind of it, you know, so the people that are really um, not happy about this at all, and I completely understand, are the people who were doing a really nice job of differentiating a product, say eggs or meat from birds, that had to do with the fact that the birds were free range, and, you know, that, you know, and, and the organic or all natural, those, those issues don't get impacted by this, because you can still get feeds that are organic or, or natural, and then you can still call your birds, you know, credibly um, those, um, those labels, but, um, but free range, not so much. So, um, you know, and, and I don't know what all of those producers are choosing to do. Uh, maybe some of them feel like the risk is not as high because they're inland. Um, and uh, however, a lot of the, you know, we have a lot of lakes in Maine. <laughs> there are a lot of birds who fly inland that, you know, are look at, looking for water that are waterfowl. And so, you know, you're not immune. Um, so um, limit and also limit visitors. Um, so AI is something that can come in on somebody's shoes. Um, so it's still a good idea to, uh, you know, although we all love our birds, not to necessarily have your birds be a big item, you know, when you're, having people come visit you. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I also think that um, it's really important to remind people that every time you bring a group of new birds into your flock, you're introducing whatever the heck those birds have, which may not be making those birds sick. And so there are some things that birds shed, small amounts of some viruses, for instance, Merrick's virus, leukosis, um, uh, you know, uh, bronchitis virus, there are a lot of things that birds may not be showing you that they have, but they may be carrying. And then if you put them into a new flock of birds, those birds are naive. Uh, they've never, to that, they've never experienced that before and may become ill with it. So I do not, I'm not a big fan of introducing new birds. I know though a lot of folks that try to rehabilitate or rescue birds will oftentimes have many different birds come into their flocks it's a choice. A, another thing about risk limitation that, you, you know, they may be more uh, happy with that risk. I, I remember you, you talking about in our previous podcast about having like a, a set of birds and then basically having a period of time where there's no birds. So right. you, you have a bunch of birds, they're giving you eggs, you're enjoying that for X number of years. And then those birds go away somehow <laughs> one way or another yeah and then there's no birds for mm. you know a period of time right there's lots of air and sunlight and you clean everything and so right. on and some time 
then you bring in new birds as opposed to just cycling in and out birds. This, this is Correct. basically what you're alluding to, right? It, it, yeah, I am. And it's what we call all in, all out. All in, all out. And that, that basic concept is how people raise swine, for instance. Swine are very sensitive to a number of disease issues. And so a, another type of animal that you want to have very kind of isolated in their group, I guess, you get their little pod, right? You know, raise them in pods. Um, the other thing, I guess, a couple other things, um, you know, obviously keeping wild birds out and that, you know, that even those little perching birds that like to fly through the chicken wire, um, which only holds your chickens in and does not hold wild birds out. Um, and uh, I prefer hardware cloth, which has, it's, it's a stiffer wire mesh and the mesh size is usually about maybe a half an inch. So no little birds are going to go through that. Um, it also keeps rodents out really nicely and raccoons and ermine and other kinds of predators you don't want. Um, right. And another thing is, okay, so if you, for instance, decide that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my birds in the tractor, you know, so a movable coop. And so I will, yeah, I'll be keeping them in, um, kind of, but I get to move that around to the different places. Just bear in mind that you don't want to put that tractor where wild birds may have been. And so remember that that avian influenza can get passed onto your birds in the defecations of those wild birds. Right. They may be in there for a while. Don't forget that, right? That's right. So just for mm -hmm. people that are a tractor is like a, a box that's on wheels that mm -hmm. <laughs> either has a roof or has no, it's basically a chicken wire box on kind of. wheels yeah. uh, that's low enough that the chickens can't get out and you you put the chickens in and you roll it out on your lawn and they peck mm -hmm. around on the lawn and you put a different piece of lawn every day. And it seems like a great, th great way to do uh, free range, uh, a little bit of free range type thing. Also without having a chicken coop prop, like, a, you know, a, a, you know, it's a way of extending your, 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 your area where they can go mess around and have a good time. Yeah. But what you're saying is while they're nosing around on the ground, they could stick their face in some bird they poop. Could. <laughs> absolutely yeah i know and get the uh, bird flu <laughs> i know yeah well you know yeah. it, i mean this is all in the face of also i do research on um some parasites that are carried by snails that right. can affect our grazing livestock like our sheep and goats um and so we kind of advocate for um what well, we do advocate for using poultry sometimes to help remove snails from your pastures yeah animals are going to be. Um, and uh, it can be pretty effective. But right now, I, you know, I have to think, okay, let's see, now they got to raise, they got to balance the risk of one thing versus the other. Um, and so again, keeping your birds contained as much as you can and keeping wild birds out is, is the best practice. To what um, extent do people, I mean, there's, I can't remember the variety now, there's a particular type of hen that people swear by and I don't, I, I don't think I've read a paper on actual efficacy, but mm -hmm. it's a type of hen. Uh, I wish I could remember what it's called now. It, it, it might be a guinea hen. Yeah. So it's for ticks, right? They, yeah, they like, it, exactly. they like having these, they, they swear that if you have two or three of these and they're running around your property, your property's tick free. I think that, I don't know if that's how, I anyway. That's I'm, very optimistic. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. they are. <laughs> They are very active birds and they do like to forage, um, but they can also be spoiled. If you wanna have one and raise it on cracked corn, it's gonna be just as spoiled as anybody else. Um, we found that we actually use ducks for, um, for foraging for snails and they seem to like doing it quite a lot. Um, we did another small trial where we used a bunch of uh, Rhode Island reds, I think, and so chickens um, and uh, they did well. Um, so, yeah, both for ticks and for snails. Um, I think that probably birds are, are you know, they're not 100% effective, but I think that they certainly do anecdotally anyway, reduce the loads. So what I wanted to ask you is like, to what extent, because I'm mm -hmm. sure you have ticks in Maine, um, <laughs> to what extent are people more reluctant to keep their birds in if they're, if, if they strongly I mean, believe that the the birds are managing the ticks on the property. Right. Has there been pushback? Well, Has there been any anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've had this conversation with more than one uh, bird owner. And so what I keep going back to is, okay, it's risk management. You know, again, you have to decide 
you know, what am I, what's the biggest, the bigger uh, current and present danger um, right. to me and my family, right? And so, and that's really important. We have a lot of ticks. We have a lot of tick-borne disease. I just found my my dog is positive for Lyme disease and anaplasmosis. Oh. I know. Wow. She's not she's not ill with either one of them, but she's positive for them. So she's been exposed to them, and she's had almost no ticks on her. Um, so, but one got through at some point. Um, so so my short answer to your great question is um, that I do. I would assume that some of our clients are going to be putting their birds out to do that kind of tick foraging that they would normally do. Right. They're just sort just of, figure, uh, you know, we're just going to try it out. And that's good because the, if they, if they do it after having managed, you know, thought through the risks and balance the risk, only you can right. do that for your situation. And right. so I'm, I'm all for that. But I will say though, that again, with the avian influenza virus, the things that are going to kill it on the landscape are going to be sunlight, drying, and time. And so if summer starts really being summer, which it might do this weekend, <laughs> um, then, you know, the amount of it left kind of out there is probably going to be mitigated quite a bit. Right. And, and so then when the waterfowl come through again, which they tend to do in the early fall, we get big, massive groups of them on the river out here, for instance. Um, we expect that avian influenza will come through again and we'll probably see a wave of cases. We hope we don't, but we expect we'll probably see a wave of cases again in the fall. So if people are going to um, you know, decide that they're going to have birds outside foraging or something, then, you know, do it when the chances of the virus being, um, you know, much less on the landscape, um, you know, due to sunlight and drying and, you know, some really nice weather have occurred. So, right. You know, just uh, people contact me and say, is it safe now? You know, and uh, all I can say is, well, you know, in a relative sense, <laughs> but it's, you know, if you really want to be super, if you've got like some breeding heritage stock and it would just kill you to lose them, you know, you might want to be more conservative about your choices. Uh, so, so um, uh, other things like um, controlling rodent infestations, making sure that um, you are, your, your coop is more or less predator proof will indirectly help with reducing avian influenza spread as well. Um, uh, just because birds that are hassled by rodents are oftentimes more susceptible to other things. Um, and if rodents can get through, then possibly the little birds can, who knows? Anyway, so, um, so some of these though, just returning to that is thinking that um, this is probably a great opportunity to really look at what your bird's housing is like yeah. and how could you make it better? Um, that does not mean that you have to go out and spend you know, $40,000 on the McMansion for birds, but it does mean that um, you should really look at like how water is delivered to your birds. You know, do you have a good dependable water feeder in this hot weather? water can, uh, it's amazing how fast it disappears. Birds drink a lot more in this weather. Mm. And um, the other thing is that they all need to be able to get at the water simultaneously. So you have to think about if you have a circular waterer, um, then, you know, can, and can or will all the birds go at it at one time? Um, or do you have enough birds that you really ought to think about investing in another water source for them? Could be just another circular water, depending on your coop size. But Think about all of that right now. And then um, the other one, of course, in summer, especially is ventilation. So if you can smell ammonia, then you need to do something because where you're standing up there smelling the ammonia, the level of ammonia at your bird's height is going to be a lot higher. So um, think about, you know, cleaning the bedding, freshening the bedding, putting dry shavings on top of whatever you have in there. Um, and uh, then also, even more importantly, what's the airflow through there? Um, it's so, a, yeah. Is, is the smell of ammonia, so is it the fact that they're breathing it in and it weakening their young, lungs, or is it the fact that because you can smell it, it's a sign that you've got, it's not clean enough, you have poor airflow, you know, is the smell of it a sign of something else, or is it also just them breathing this sort of 
ammonia smelling air is, is compromising their, their lung health? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, you know, it, it's primarily that the ammonia is, uh, it, it's very irritating to mucous okay. membranes of the eyes and the respiratory system, but it's also the, the other, that it is an indicator that your bedding isn't optimized. So if, yeah. if your bedding, for instance, is composting in place, say you do deep bedding and uh, maybe there's soil underneath it. And so your normal thing is that the bedding gets to build up during the winter until it's fairly deep. You just keep putting dry bedding on top and the birds are, are help, healthy and happy because you've also been punching down into that bedding with a manure fork or something to get air down there and that will help it compost in place and that tends to be a healthier system um, for the birds it also releases heat which in the winter is a real plus in the summer I, most of us tend to dig out our coops and then um, you know if we do get ammonia smell then probably we just need to rebed um, right. but anyway so so yeah, as ventilation is hugely important and you don't want your birds to be in high wind or drafts, but you do want to have a setup so that you can have like uh, screened windows that, you know, that air tends to come in one side and go out the other and that helps to flush out the air quality in there. Same way you would have built a, a house in the old days. Absolutely. Before we had all these HVAC systems, that was crap. Yeah, there you go. It doesn't even work that well uh, half the time. That's, that's right. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, um, yeah. And then um, nest boxes is one of my favorite things to rant about, but just be, keep, keep your nest boxes um, clean and bed them weekly um, to keep your birds healthy. And then, then the, biggest, the biggest thing is going to be keeping your birds from getting bored. And, right. and, and, you know, they're, you know, they may not they may not be Einstein, but they have an active mind and they need to do a lot. And, um, and so deep litter, we, talk, we were talking about the bedding before, and deep litter is actually a lot of fun for birds. And even if you just choose to over supply them with shavings, um, you know, so you've got several inches in there, say you, they don't really need that, but they like it. And throw in some cracked corn and they will have a lot of fun foraging around for it. Right. Um, and um, the other thing is, um, you know, like all of your gardening enthusiasts that listen to your podcast know that sometimes, you know, you get these big, ugly kale stalks and things like that that are left over. Or maybe you go down to the grocery store and there's some truly ugly cabbage that they're willing to have you take away for almost nothing. And you can, um, you can use those. Uh, sometimes you can hang them on a rope or something, um, make them into interesting uh, enrichment toys for the birds. And that will tend to take the birds' attention away from each other because bored birds start picking on each other and uh, they can yes. actually damage each other really badly. So, you told me this before. I remember you have to give them something to do or they'll find something to do. Yeah, uh. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, remove that that vegetation when it's no longer fresh, you know, because they, they can get sick from spoiled stuff. Right. But there's also things you can, I mean, yeah, there's lots of crazy toys and things you can buy online. I don't, I'm not a big advocate for that, but you can use um, PVC pipe um, joints and things like that and get a little creative and you can create um, puzzle feeders and things like that. Uh, make yeah. it work for it a bit, yeah. No, oh, yeah. Birds yeah. love that stuff. Um, they're, they're, they have, I, I bought some of these for my cats. Um, I had a couple overweight cats for a while and so I had one of these toy, uh, they're, they're a ball that you fill with cat food and they have a dialable um, aperture in there. And when the ball rolls around, a certain number of pieces of food fall out. So it encourages the cat to play with the toy so that they can earn their food. And you, they actually have them for birds. Um, right. So um, they make swings that can go in a coop. Um, I, I've never tried one of those, but if you expand your perches and so have more and different perches that go up the walls and things like that, birds love that stuff. And as long as you have, um, you want to always have many more perching spaces than you have birds. Right. And then, then they can have fun, you know, kind of pushing each other around and getting away to a more interesting place. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. 
okay. you know, keep your birds happy and interested. And that's a challenge. But, um, you know, the, you, if you're, you know, if you really feel like your birds really need some space and need to get out, I mean, there are indoor arenas and things like that. Um, as long as you know that, you know, wild migrating birds haven't been there, what the heck? But, okay. um, uh, you know, I, I like, you know, I have a border collie, so I'm, I keep threatening to get some ducks because I want to herd ducks around, but uh, that's a different issue okay. and problem. Um, so, uh, yeah, next the question I have is if someone does have free range chickens and that's really important to them, either because it's a small business or just for their own, you know, they want free range eggs and they want to raise their own free range eggs. Mm -hmm. And because there's a risk of bird flow around there, they've been instructed to uh to keep them in is mm -hmm. is there a way they can have an indoor free range ticket <laughs> is there yeah i mean it's it's i don't know that, so there are very strict um rules about what these terms mean and who right. can use yes. them yes. in marketing um yes. so so but as, apart from that because i'm not an expert on that but apart from that um if your birds are, um, they use, they have these, uh, what they call um, floor birds. And floor birds is a term that was um, derived from the uh, commercial chicken industry a number of years ago when they were trying to get cage free. Um, and so the idea of being cage free, of course, is that they're never in any kind of enclosure. So that would be like free range is the ultimate expression of that. But the floor birds was um, something that was done a lot, still is done in um, a lot of places. Um, and that is that uh, we have the big groups of birds that are in a big open building. So is it like a gymnasium? Is that the idea? Kind of, yeah. That they have they have their um, they have nests and they have feeders and they have waterers, um, and but they they're free to run around all over the floor. Right. So things like that can be a way of doing it. Um, and uh, it, I think though it's important to know that um, in the um, current situation, uh, what I've heard uh, from talking to people who are professionals with like Mopka and you know, some of the other organic farming groups is that some of the rules about um, how your birds are maintained have been suspended in the, you know, the face of avian influenza. So whoever you're, <clears throat> if some of your, our listeners are um, involved with certifying agencies, um, then they should check with their agency. Because, right. you know, again, this is affecting so many farms in so many places that they want people to use best practices. And I right see. now that's keeping your birds in. So I see. So they have almost like like a variance on the uh, on the definition right. for for practical reasons, because yeah. otherwise you could lose your whole flock because a couple of them get it. Yeah. Um, so. And your neighbors. <laughs> May have yes. issues. Yeah, yeah. Like there's all these implications, right? You could you yeah. could be patient zero uh, yeah, for your whole that. neighborhood. No, no mm -hmm. one wants to be patient zero. Right. <laughs> um, oh, and one more thing I wanted to uh, just uh, to raise a public awareness about a, about a uh, agricultural extension. So you work at one of these at university. Can you just explain? I just said at the University of Maine in Orno, but there's it's way longer. Uh, so <laughs> so can you explain? Sorry, sorry, your the agricultural extension yeah. association with the university and what it does. Yeah, agricultural extension is um it's basically something that's that was funded federally um I think in the middle of the eighteen hundreds uh, to help um to t basically to help translate the sort of findings that were going on at agricultural schools across the United States into usable information for farmers. So it was a way of taking the egg egghead part of um, you know what goes on and making it into eggs, right? You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, and it's really persisted like that. It, it also does things like they host the 4-H uh, sort of you know programs here in the United States. Um, the, again, same deal, and um, was always was um, trying to foster agricultural competency in in youth. Um, right. And uh, so it's it's. It's morphed a lot because, you know, of course, as people moved into cities and, and you know, and also go online and do things like that. So the, what we do with our time and our 
energies is different. Um, so it has different questions to help answer. But right now, for instance, uh, agricultural extension here in, in um, Maine is very, very involved with the PFAS issue, uh, trying to help farmers um, deal with, you know, having PFAS on their land and trying to decide what how best can they mitigate that? Uh, you know, what is, I don't even know what that is. PFAS? Avoid the risk. PFAS. Um, that's uh, basically a shortcut for um, uh, the name of a number of different um, byproducts of chemicals that uh, have been utilized for a number of years um, in all kinds of products. Many of those products end up uh, in the sewage systems uh, of all of our towns and cities. And then that municipal sewage sludge was, for some years after composting, being spread on agricultural lands here in Maine. Not all, but there were a number of different farmers who said, yeah, this is great. It's highly nitrogenous. It, we're told it's safe. And so they would put it on their hay ground and things like that. And, um, and what it does is it leaves residues of these very, very um, pervasive and relatively indestructible um, plastics, essentially, in the ground. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that is not... <laughs> Is my dog again? She doesn't even like the word. Um, it's something that is not confined to our area. Right. Um, it's actually worldwide going, going to be more of a problem. And uh, there have been people talking about it for a number of years, like in Europe and other parts of the United States. But Maine kind of suddenly we had it being found in some agricultural wells. And so those farmers suddenly had to deal with you know, the legacy of this practice. Um, uh, not necessarily their fault. Um, yeah. And it's a, you know, it's it's a problem we're trying to figure out how to deal with uh, um, and, and prevent any further. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, something- Does it have a negative effect on crop yields or is it uh, negatively affecting the the uh, food security, the, the safety of the food or what? what? What yeah, effects? well, it is. Um, it's not neg negatively affecting the crop yields, um, but um, it is. Uh, it's not a safe chemical. Um, it's considered carcinogenic. Um, uh, yeah, it's of not. Good. Okay. I know. Yeah. And um, you know, so there's several things going on. One is that we can detect it better than we used to be able to, and I, I think that the federal agencies. Um, don't really know completely what to make of it. So they've changed, they've suddenly changed the allowable levels in, um, in drinking water and, and some foods, I think. And, uh, and so those levels now are so low that they're actually very difficult to detect. Um, and so if you've got to have it down to those levels, it's like, well, if there's any of it that's not safe um, or not okay, then what do you do with, you know, your animals, say, if you've had animals being fed on this hay or whatever, or on that field, um, what if it's in milk? You know, how long is it going to take to get out of the cow? And we're, we're finding out now that you can uh, do what they call depuration, where you're, you know, feeding the animal um, clean feed and water, and, uh, and they do um, get it out of their systems after a period of time. So that's somewhat hopeful. Huh. But on the other hand, how do we get it out of the land? And so yeah. I know this is not pretty, um, but extensions really trying to jump on top of that one and help. And obviously we're not the only ones and we're not, you know, we're not all toxicologists, <laughs> but by a long shot. But the idea is rather that we take the research that people are doing in different venues, um, and try to translate that and help the farmers get information that they need. It's a real shame. I've, I've always thought that composted human sewage was, you know, a good solution. I know. <laughs> you know, like, well, you it know, makes sense, right? I know, it, it does. The, I did too. Um, and I think all of us had, you know, probably a good, I, I'm sorry, a good opinion of it. Um, yeah. It's a good opinion as you can. <laughs> I know of poop, right? Yes. Um, but but the thing is, um, 
I, we didn't know. And, uh, and their problem is really um, focuses on these fire retardant chemicals. They seem to be the ones that are, uh, you know, they're fluorinated and they, and they just are reactive even after they break down um, quite a little bit. So, um, so anyway, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a terrible topic, but it is a good example of how uh, extension has had to pivot um, yeah. and jump in um when there are you know uh current and present dangers and yes. that's that's one right there so it's much more fun to talk about chickens <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but, i just yeah. before we get into it i just want to say to the viewers that like this is you know i always find it interesting when when people have a question about anything relating to gardening or you know uh raising uh, poultry or animal husbandry or whatever and they'll go on they'll google or go on facebook and find some guy like me talking about it and uh, I never do that. Like if I have a question uh, about gardening, that's what I mainly do. Or if a viewer asks me something I don't know the answer to, I usually type in, you know, keywords associated with that question. And I put the word extension at the end. Mm -hmm. And I find, I look for uh, more than one article published out of an agricultural extension. And it's usually in the States, because we don't have, we have something like that in Canada, but they don't seem to be as active. They're doing they're publishing in peer reviewed papers and they're not doing the public outreach stuff you guys do. So, I mean, if I do a, a search on a given topic, I can, I can find uh, an actual paper in a journal sometimes. Um, but oftentimes I can find like a two page article written by someone like you published out of an extension. I, in fact, I think that's how I originally found you to do our original talk because you'd written yeah. this nice article. And then I sort of Googled you and I said, oh, she's been on the radio. She can probably talk and probably has a personality. She'd probably be great for the show sort of thing, right? Um, so that's, uh, you know, so just for, for people out there, you know, that's to me the best, the best, I mean, sure, watch my channel, right? But um, that's the best place to go uh, to get this sort of information. <laughs> Great. Well, and this has been, uh, I think, the mother of all bird flu podcasts in the history of the world. <laughs> so we yeah, there's it. lots of them going on. <laughs> so thank you well, for being willing to discuss it. I think no, it's, it's an great. important topic. Yeah, no, I hope uh, lots of people benefit from this and uh, get, a, you know, uh, just get thinking about it. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we lower the risk, but we also lower the fear uh, you know, and uh, yeah. you sort of increase the just the general uh, awareness and liter uh, what do you call it? literacy or the mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, again, thank you. That's oh, very yeah. fun. <laughs> Great, and thanks for being on the podcast, okay. everybody. Uh, you know, thanks for listening. I hope uh, for those of you that are either you're you're you have birds right now, or you're thinking about doing it, or you're just generally intellectually curious. I hope you found it interesting. I know I did, even though I don't have birds. Uh, so uh, everyone out there, thanks for listening or thanks for watching. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. And thank you so much for joining us again. Yay. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Great. Thanks Great. a lot. Hey, folks, want to help support everything I'm doing here? Check out my sponsors, Vessie's Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. For Vessie's, go to their website, Vessie's.com. Use my coupon code GAVS22 and you'll get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in your order and there's no oversized items in your order. Check out the description box of this video for details. Uh, for Safer's products, Woodstream products, you can buy all the things I use in my garden, Slug and Snail, Killer, BTK, and all. You can buy that from Vessies or you can go to their websites uh, for a much wider range of products to solve just about any kind of problem that you can imagine. Uh, with high quality natural ingredients like oils from seeds and flowers and stuff like that. Uh, for, if, you, if you're in Canada, go to woodstreambrands.ca and as long as your order is over $69, you get free shipping. If you're in the United States of America, then go to saferbrand.com and as long as your order is over $45 US, you'll get free shipping from them. So yeah, if you want to help support the channel and the podcast and they sell something you need, Buy from them, and that'll help support everything I'm doing here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>